Did you just do it with your finger? That's it. Yeah. I just played Dancing Queen. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happens? Sometimes you get lucky. Is it for me? Is it for us? How can that be? You're humbled by it and grateful, but no one understands it really. It's too much. It's an amazing feeling, really, to feel so loved. We're lucky. Yeah. We are. We've been a lucky bunch. 1977. It was the end of summer and the start of something special. Nothing could have prepared Frida, Benny, Bjorn and Anietta for this. And there was ABBA everywhere. I don't know how that happened. It was very exciting, yeah. And everyone loved them. Really, really loved them, yeah. People everywhere knew the songs. They were singing with us. Fantastic. And also very spread in ages. There were older people. There were small kids. What are you here for anyway? The ABBA concert. The ABBA concert. Oh, yeah, for sure. Who's ABBA? Who's ever? Oh, you've got to be joking. <laughs> Who do you think? The famous Swedish Four pop stars. Have you seen them before? No, only on the television. From here, ABBA mania was unleashed on the world. And now, it looks like they're coming back. I am still free. Take a chance on me. <laughs> 2019, there will be a show, a live show. So there will be a reunion. It's there fantastic. will be, yeah. This is the sea. Yeah. More from Benny on the unexpected return of ABBA later. That's a good verse, I think. Yeah. Forty years on from the Australian tour that meant so much, the members of ABBA still can't explain why it all worked so well. Millions of people happen to have the same taste as Benny and me and the girls. That's how I see it. Really? Yeah, that's the only way I can see it. But we never knew exactly why we did that or that, other than that intuition said that this is wonderful. Let's keep this. I've come to Sweden and caught a ride on Benny's old motor cruiser to a place that's very special to the group. This is where much of the music of ABBA was created. In a hut on a tiny island called Vigsa in Stockholm's archipelago. Agneta and I have bought a place there, and later Ben and Frida did. You know, in the early morning, I used to hear sounds of someone playing piano up there, and I knew Benny had arrived. So I used to make a pot of coffee, take my guitar and walk up there, and then we'd sit there, you know, the whole day long, and right away. The verse didn't come at the same time as the bridge, or the chorus might have come before everything else. They came in bits and pieces, and then they would click together, and you would have a song. What were your greatest hopes for ABBA when you set out? Well, that someone would listen to what we'd done and say, yeah, I like this. Before ABBA, Agneta was already well known in Sweden. She had a string of hits starting out as a teenager. Tell me about the first time you heard your song on the radio. Wow, that was uh, very, very fantastic because uh, all my childhood, I mean, I was dreaming about this, to be a singer and to be famous. And I was sitting in front of the mirror and, you know, did this lip sync and to my favorite singers. guys in the band swear that I fell in love by, just by hearing her voice. 
Is that true? Uh, I mean, I, I, yes, I think so. There was something, you know, so incredibly attractive in that voice, even before I knew the girl. Bjorn, who was in a folk band, met Agneta on a TV special. We did a, a duet together. After that, we were very soon a couple. A young Frida was carving out her own solo career. She caught the eye of ABBA's most famous recruit, Benny Anderson. You were dating Frida and he was dating Agneta, but it didn't enter your head that the four of you should form a group. No. Funny, isn't it? I think you were on holiday in Cyprus in 1970 when you all started singing together. Do you remember? Do you remember that? Well, thing? because we had, yeah, it was like a free holiday for a week. I said, you sing a couple of songs every night and you don't have to pay for the trip. So we said, yeah, OK, let's do that. Do you remember how it felt when you first heard all of your voices singing together? Well, it wasn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the girls were always, they were always good singers. They were. In the archives of a photographic agency in Gothenburg, rare negatives of Bjorn, Agneta, Benny and Frida performing as a professional group for the first time. These are amazing. It was November 1970. Back then, ABBA was called Festfolk, meaning party people. Do you remember this? Oh, my God, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. I had hoped that this was completely forgotten. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Where did you get it? Don't tell anyone. <laughs> this this is the low ebb of, the, of, 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 you know, <laughs> the collaboration between the four of us. Why did it go so wrong? Because we were, we were not doing what we were supposed to do. We were singing other people's songs in a sort of, that's a kind of cabaret act. Benny and I were doing a number where we were supposed to be two little boys. Yeah, what? No, don't say you got a picture of that as well. I'm so sorry to say, but, um... <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> sorry, Bjorn. Oh. You were that bad? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. It, it was embarrassing. But, but it was after that tour that we realised our own songs, that's what we should do. They changed their name to ABBA and their first big hit in Europe was Ring Ring. Do you remember the first time that you realised your voice and Frida's voice sounded pretty good together? Yeah, we could feel that from the beginning, I think, when we did Ring Ring and we had fantastic reaction. With Ring Ring, you recorded and re-recorded and re-recorded the instruments and the voices to create a much fuller sound. We did the backing track and, and then we did it again at a slightly higher speed to create a bigger sound. What also made ABBA appealing was the dynamics of the two couples performing together. Agneta and Bjorn were married in 1971. They had their first child, Linda, in 1973. And a year later, the Eurovision Song Contest put ABBA on the world stage. They didn't think they'd have a chance. They thought they'd place well behind Olivia Newton-John, whose British heritage allowed her to sing for the UK. You know, Olivia Newton-John. Our Olivia Newton-John. Famous. Newton -John. And I thought, you know, six, number six is, is going to be good. Oh, that's where you thought you'd go. Yeah, yeah. Describe for me what you were feeling when you ran out and started singing. Scary. <laughs> it was very, very scary. I didn't expect us to win. When we won, it was a fantastic moment, really. Traditionally, Eurovision Song Contest winners seem to be one-hit wonders. Mm. So you had a bit of trouble breaking into the market after that, didn't you? We did. We, we chose the wrong song as a follow-up to begin with. In everybody's minds, it seemed that they had decided they'll be forgotten. And uh, it was a struggle. Yeah. And I... I you know, we have our Australian friends to thank for the fact that we came back. 
And we've finally come to the one that's the current seller in, the, in, in Australia at the moment and all across the world, which is Dancing Queen. Can you just tell us a little about how you actually wrote Dancing Queen and what it, what it is about? Uh, well, it's about one of... Uh, it, it's a girl, ordinary girl, and she's, uh, she only lives, actually, when she's in the disco dancing. I remember when we did a Dancing Queen, when we recorded it, because we could feel that this is really something. This, this song is going to be big, <laughs> because we could feel we had ghost bumps really? on our arms, yeah. <laughs> so it was special. Dancing Queen, that was massive, yeah? A few of my friends singing it and, and loving it, and they were queens as well, so they <laughs> loved Dancing Queen. <laughs> Quite like myself. <laughs> The musical brilliance of Benny and the lyrical mastery of Bjorn was given voice by Agneta and Frida, whose competitive nature only made the music that much better. People like to suggest that you hated each other, but mm. it was a healthy rivalry, wasn't it? It was uh, healthy on the stage because we really did our best. Yeah. To, to get the audience with us, both Frida and I. Yeah. It was kind of like you were competing for the audience. Yeah, I, you can say that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that meant you pushed each other to give an even better performance. That's right. Yeah. And the same in the studio. Yeah, yeah. It was, we were always standing in front of each other with a mic in between and we had uh, very, very funny, funny times. <laughs> Now, 14 months ago, ABBA were only known in Sweden, which is absolutely amazing. And since then, they've become the biggest record sellers in Australia. They've caught the imagination of toddlers, teenagers and grandmothers alike. And today, they are topping the charts right around the world. But while ABBA was hogging the countdown charts, homegrown artists like John Paul Young, or Squeak, were getting annoyed. Seriously, here is the number one record. Say goodnight, Squeak. Goodnight, Squeak. I think we all know what the number one record is by now because this yep. is the one that kept Squeak from being number one on the countdown top ten for about three weeks, four weeks. Uh, well, that doesn't really matter, though, because uh, number two is better than number three. What do you think of ABBA? I hate the music! <laughs> but not really. <laughs> you actually really like it, don't I you? I do. I do, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do, I do. <laughs> In 1976, you had a huge hit with I Hate the Music, mm -hmm. but it just couldn't get to number one. Why was that? Ah, <laughs> oh, can you hear the drums, Fernando? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they had, the, they had Fernando, which, you know, to be honest, I didn't think was one of their best. It was, it was a great song, you know, and you'll find me singing it at any given moment, but it just sat there and sat there and sat there and it wouldn't go away. And I hate the music was number two behind it all the way. And, you know, it's, it's amusing. But there was more bad news for John Paul Young. The Swedish invaders were on their way to Australia for a spectacular tour and Molly had the scoop. Okay, well now the million dollar question for Australian um, listeners and viewers and record buyers. What colour is an orange? <laughs> what colour is an orange? <laughs> no. That's um, Queensland. Yeah, that's for Queensland, all right. For New South Wales, Victoria and the rest, and Queensland. Um, are you going to come to Australia? And are you going to tour and can we see you live in concert? Yes. Well, I suggest you start... Uh, <laughs> booking, I don't know, I won't even say how to get your tickets because I think there could be massacre on the street. Sunday, February 27th, 1977. ABBA touched down in Sydney. Only the Beatles had attracted crowds as big. Little way. The fantastic, amazing thing, having people, you know, along all that way, waving <laughs> with uh, flags and banners, and that was something incredible because that very rarely happened in those days, anywhere. Among ABBA's entourage was makeup artist and costume designer Ingmarie Halling, a few months earlier, she'd been surprised by a phone call from Frida. There was Frida on the phone and she said, we are going on a tour to Australia and 
we wonder if you want to come along to work with the costumes and the makeup and help us in the dressing room. And how long did it take you to decide to go? Well, yeah, nine seconds. <laughs> in Australia, Ingmarie was with ABBA 24-7, an insider as ABBA mania swept across the country. You know, everyone was taken by surprise. It was really? like nothing you'd seen before. No, no. Hello, everybody. This is Frida. I really appreciate Hello. this. I love you. <laughs> the band was overwhelmed and deeply worried they'd disappoint the enormous frenzied throng. We were thinking, well, this is going to be, you know, the last nail in the coffin. We're coming here. It's only going to just blow up because it's, uh, the expectations were very high, I think, from the audience. And you can never live up to, to high expectations. That's the feeling that I had, at least. Here we are, ABBA, in Australia for their long tour. A day after arriving, ABBA held a press conference in Sydney. To this day, it's remembered for one brazen question. I read somewhere where you are the proud owner of an award which declares you as the lady with the most sexiest bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? How can I answer to that? I don't know. I haven't seen it. <laughs> now, I'd like to apologise on behalf of our nation's obsession with your bottom. Oh, it was not only there. <laughs> <laughs> well... It could be worse things. <laughs> <laughs> How did you feel about that at the time? You were, I guess, one of the biggest sex symbols in the world. We didn't think about that so much, actually. Neither Frida or I, but we were, of course, we're very aware of when we were on the stage that thought that we were something special. That gave us a very nice feeling really, and also the fact that we were so different. Mama, 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 mama. Do you take drugs or alcohol or anything like that? No drugs. <laughs> no drugs. You're clean. <laughs> no, not clean, but we don't take any drugs. <laughs> like all big stars, ABBA had what's known as a rider, a list of requirements for each of their Australian shows, and it confirms they certainly weren't teetotalers. Two bottles of French dry champagne, well chilled. Two bottles of Perrier water, one bottle of scotch, Johnny Walker black label. <laughs> Half bottle of Negrita rum, 10 bottles of Coca-Cola, tea, coffee, milk, lemon, sugar, cups, glasses and spoons. <laughs> Tell me about the Sydney concert, if you remember it. It was pouring rain and mm. you and the other members of the band risked your lives for us. Yes, it's not uh, easy to stand on a stage outside with so many people and just say we, we can't do it. People were just shouting and screaming and having a good time even though it was pouring down. Everyone had umbrellas. 30, 40,000 umbrellas at the same time going up. That was fantastic. It was just so loud and it was like electricity in the air, which was probably from the storm that was happening as well, but <laughs> <laughs> I think it was coming directly from the people. The hype of it was just amazing. Roxanne Dixon was eight years old when she, her mother and sisters made it to the front row of ABBA's stormy Sydney concert. People were shocked just how loud ABBA were, a real rock concert. And it was just, as soon as that music started, you know, the heart just went. My mum says she started, as soon as she heard the music, she started grinning and that grin did not leave her face the whole time. <laughs> so, I think everyone was just in shock. Australia's obsession with ABBA continued in Melbourne. Fans brought the city centre to a standstill for a town hall welcome. They were different to anything else that was around at the time. They were so beautiful. The music is just so fantastic. The songs are so catchy. And 
They were so brilliantly done that they seemed like really simple pop songs, but they weren't. So I think that's partly why the music grabbed everyone so much. Even though it seemed like really light-hearted pop music, there's something, you know, a lot more serious underneath. What do you think it is about ABBA that has so captivated Australians? Well, apparently brilliant music, because their music is brilliant. And I think that with Australians, they could sense uh, that, like Aussies are, they were down to earth, you know? Yeah. Absolutely down to earth, you know? How does that feel as an artist to see thousands and thousands of people waving and screaming? Mostly you're humbled by it the fact that this is actually happening mm. and, and they're out there because of you and because of something that we had done. As ABBA headed home, fans lined the road and crowded into the airport, devastated to see them go, and the feeling was mutual. I want to jog your memory here, so hopefully it'll play. Um, Goodbye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's when we are going to leave Australia that time. Uh -huh. So I remember we felt very, very sad. And we wanted so much to, to grab their hands, so, but we had to leave this wonderful country. So that was sad. Goodbye. You wanted to kind of give more to the fans. Mm. We had such a good time as well. Yeah. So we didn't want to go back. Over a 10-year career, ABBA became one of the most successful bands in the world. Catchy choruses and upbeat music delivered hit after hit, more than 380 million records sold. But the songs were only part of the package. Tell me about those clothes. Uh, they were very, very special. Yeah. And when you're looking back, it maybe can look very strange. It was not very comfortable <laughs> sometimes <laughs> with the high heels. But When ABBA was on stage, they owned it. But in truth, they all much preferred to write and record music at home in Sweden. for the music is very special to you because you mm. were you were very heavily pregnant. Yeah, I was pregnant and um, and the doctor said that she she's not allowed to push too much. I mean, you have really to work when you record and and going up on high tones. So I had to be very careful. So they fixed like a chair but a bed. Yeah. So I could near yeah, be lying down and I, I, ne I nearly lie down singing that song. Wow, yeah. you were actually reclining while singing Thank You For The Music. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was special <laughs> with the stomach. Nine months after the Australian tour, Agneta and Bjorn had their second child, Christian. Then the following year, Frida and Benny were married. The band was riding high. It's quite wonderful to be able to, to work with what you enjoy most and to have success with it. ABBA never returned to Australia. They toured the world again in 1979, but the closest they came was Japan. We like the Japanese people are very open and very free and we feel, make us feel good. Thank you. <laughs> But the pop star life was taking its toll on everyone. What is it like to experience that extraordinary level of fame where everybody in the world, it seems, loves you? How can you explain that? It's so difficult. You, you start, you get used to it, I think. But um, I think you, you never think about 
what people don't think about that there are backsides as well. And for example, to being recognized everywhere. Do you think that once Agneta had, had children, that changed everything, didn't it? Because more than all the fame, it was motherhood that she wanted. Both of us, we, I wanted fatherhood, she wanted motherhood. And we could combine it, which we did, in a good way, I think, uh, by not touring so much. You know, so we traveled less, I think, than, than any other group at that time. I think that it's a bit of a, an, a social life on tour. Uh, you just eat, sleep and go on stage and nothing more. And it kills creativity in a way that I don't like. One day when I woke up in a Europe tour, tour I started to think, where am I? In which city? And it's terrible, you know. The papers recently have been full of stories that you're going to split eventually. Uh, you're not, <laughs> no. <laughs> Ben and Bjorn has written so many good songs. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. Thank you. Yes, but you should know about that by now. <laughs> well, you never said that. <laughs> OK, so it's the first time. But soon enough, the pressures did tear the two couples apart. Both marriages ended in divorce. But the band stayed together for the music and, in a difficult time, created some of their most memorable songs. Of all of those songs, which is your favourite? OK. Uh, my favourite song is The Winner Takes It All. I think it's super, really. The Winner Takes It All. Mm. People liked to think that that was about your relationship. It was uh, right after our divorce and, and it was a bit uh, sensitive for all of us. It must have been difficult to sing at the time. Yeah, it was a bit moving, so to say. It was inspired by the pain of your breakup, wasn't it? Um, deep down, of course. Was it difficult to watch Agneta sing that song at that time in your life? That was kind of cleansing. That, the, that it, it, it was the other thing, other way around. I had written the words, she sang them, and it was somehow the right thing to do. And, and, and to then release it and, you know, let the world know. It was some, something deeply symbolic in that. In 1982, ABBA broke up, believing they and their music would soon be forgotten. We were just happy that we, were, we did so good while we were at it, you know. No one expected this to sort of continue. None of us. Yeah. When ABBA finished, you thought maybe the songs would be around for another year or so. And... Yeah, something like maybe a year, two, maybe. Yeah. That's yeah. it. That's it. That would be it. ABBA's music provided the soundtrack for a little movie called Muriel's Wedding that became a comedy classic. PJ Hogan, who uh, directed Muriel's Wedding, yeah. He really dogged you to get that music, didn't he? he yeah, well, they had to ask a couple of times because we were not sure. It's a great film. I really like that film. Which is also another thing that helped keeping us, ABBA, alive. It was enough to get even the most tone deaf singing along. In 1999, Benny and Bjorn's own stage musical, Mamma Mia, hurled ABBA back into the charts again. It became one of the highest grossing musicals, soundtracks and movies of all time. And now there's a sequel underway. And it's a new generation that, again, that knows about us. And thank God I'm so grateful for this. But for all their ongoing success, it's rare to see all four together, like they were at this opening of the Mamma Mia restaurant in Sweden last year. And last June, the unthinkable. 
For the first time since the end of ABBA, Frida and Agneta joined in song to surprise Benny and Bjorn. That was very, very nice of them to do that, yeah. Did you ever think that would happen? No, it surprised me that they wanted to do that, but was really heartwarming. And now the news ABBA fans never thought they'd hear. Sounds like ABBA's getting back together and working on a tour. I think in beginning of 2019, there will be a show, a live show, uh, with band, with a real band and dancers and, and the set design and lights and sound and all of it. Everything is live, apart from us, who are there as either holograms or in, in, in an avatar format. You can get an idea of what it may look like from the holograms at the ABBA Museum in Stockholm. We will use the recordings from our live performances mm -hmm. or from the records, mm -hmm. as well as with the band playing. You know, so the band would play, we could have the vocals from the records of the live performances. The band would play and we'd put it together. It, it takes, uh, it takes a little work, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fine. I think it's going to be great. Will all four members have some contribution into how that, that project yes. happens? we already did. Ah, mm. you've all come together and yeah. worked it out. Yeah, and we will continue to do so. There's a lot of work, you know, from just deciding what songs are we going to play. Wow. Which order will it be? Wow. Abba are going to tour again, but it's with a difference, with a magical difference. So I'll use the old saying, do yourself a favour and check it out. It's the first time the four members have collaborated since the band broke up and their millions of fans are beyond excited. Oh, a digital ABBA? We cannot believe it. It's the most exciting thing ever. Apart from the fact all four of them are working together on it, it's going to be like being at, a, at an ABBA concert which is what everyone wants. It's going to be spectacular. Very excited. And we've got another surprise for Roxanne. Right, Roxanne, how are you going? Wouldn't it be good to talk to one of the members of the band? It would be amazing to talk to one of the members of the band. <laughs> and I'm so jealous that you are. Well, Roxanne, <clears throat> say hello to Benny. Oh, my God. Hello. Hello, Benny. Hello. Hello. So where are you? I'm in Australia, in Queensland, at home. <laughs> well, I haven't been there for a while. I don't know. What has it been, 40 years or something? I don't know. When was it, 77? Yeah. Yes, 1977. Yes. <laughs> Boy. Yeah. I'm getting old. Nice talking to you too, Roxanne. OK. See you later. OK, bye for now. Bye for now, bye. Benny. Bye. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Do you pinch yourself every day? Yeah, almost, almost every day, because there's always someone you know who comes up and 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 says um, thank you for the music. How do you begin to fathom how many people have been affected by your music? I don't know, but I think it's a lot, really. And it's so spread, it's so all over the world. Mm. But it, it makes you very humble, and I'm very thankful that I have been able to do this. It means a lot.